This is a video that I've been looking forward to producing for quite a long time and nobody's actually asked me to do it, none of my viewers or subscribers, but I think many of them will find it quite interesting because what I'm going to be talking about are books and specifically tangible physical volumes that I have a personal connection with, books that I've carried with me from place to place that made a huge impact on me at different times. So with each of these, there is a personal story that goes along with it. And every one of them is, you know, one I would recommend to you to read anyway. But I, I just want to tell you about how I encountered them and what they meant to me at different times. So we begin with the uh, Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, uh, the Fitzgerald translation which is uh, quite interesting. You know, it's got all this beautiful artwork in it. And, you know, Omar Khayyam was a, um, a poet, and there's all these great, you know, translations here. There's, there's a lot of debate about how faithful the translations are, but I remember, you know, my father had this among his books, and we had a lot of books left over when he died when I was uh, 11. And then, you know, some of them I discovered in, in middle school. Some of them I discovered in high school as I did this. And I, I liked it. I, I was very impressed by it. I, I thought it contained, you know, wisdom and it was good poetry. And I, I would sometimes copy the, the uh, pictures in it uh, when I do watercolors. I remember doing that while I was in the army uh, when, you know, we were doing like guard duty and, and stuff like that in my off time. And this book has gone with me, you know, so my, my high school was over 30 years ago. This book has gone with me from move to move to move for 30 years. And I don't know what my dad found in it or, you know, whether he just bought it because it was like something people were reading at the time. But um, I've really, I've really enjoyed it, and I have, you know, gone back to it many times. You can tell that it's not in the greatest of shape, but that's the story of the Rubaiyat. Um, when I got into college, there were a set of books that I, I got, and um, two of them are straight out philosophy. One I got freshman year. I'm not sure where I bought it. But I got this copy of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, and I remember reading it and trying to puzzle out exactly what was happening. I think I mis you know, mistakenly thought that Nietzsche was writing a coherent work that would make sense across the entire uh, you know, uh, four parts of it. Um, but I, I would read it, and it was it was very exciting, you know. Um, and I also really like the cover as well. And I, I remember spending a lot of time. One of the jobs that I had was a docent in the art gallery on campus, and nobody ever came in. And I'd look, I'd walk around and look at the works of art every once in a while. You know, I'd get to chit chat with people doing stage work or stuff like that. But I spent a lot of time reading, and this was one of the books that I read a lot of. I do remember somebody, actually, a professor walking by and saying, oh, you shouldn't be reading that. And that just made me, of course, want to read it more. So this is another book that has accompanied me everywhere I've gone since college. Um, so that, that's, that's a cool one. This is another one that I, I didn't get that much out of when I first got it. I'd heard it was a, a good thing to have, The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. Um, you know, I wasn't that into Stoicism when I was an undergraduate. Um, if anything, I was into existentialism and some, you know, some Marxist stuff, some pragmatist stuff. But I, I did, you know, read and reread this. And I could tell that Marcus was somebody who was worth engaging with on my part. So, you know, this, this too, this particular translation um, by R.B. Rutherford, you know, has, has accompanied me everywhere I've gone. The next two books aren't directly philosophy as such, but they have some massive philosophy connections. So I got Gödel Escherbach probably, I, I think, my freshman year of college. 
And, you know, it's, it's quite a tome. And I read my way through it. I was so excited about all the things going on in it because I was a philosophy and mathematics major. So I was into, you know, like the foundations of logic. And, and I had friends who were into computer science, um, some of them as computer science majors, some of them on the outside doing programming, one starting his own business, which he still has today. And this was, you know, this is like major stuff. We actually talked one of the um, one of the professors in the math department who also taught computer science classes into doing a special topics class where we went through the entire book over the course of a semester and, you know, talked about all the different topics and the different issues that were in it. Um, there were some prereqs for that if I remember rightly. And so this is, this is one again that I have taken with me everywhere. Haven't read it for quite a while. I think maybe this summer I'll go back and, and reread it. It could be quite fun to do. Um, but it made a big impact on me, you know, considering Gödel's incompleteness, uh, a theorem and its, it, its applications to any formal system that ended up playing a role for me in, in graduate school. Then we have a work of literature, and it's this particular copy. I mean, this is not all of Borges' stories, but it certainly contains some of the really major ones, the ones that made a huge impact on me, like Garden of Forking Paths, um, The Lottery in Babylon, which is probably one of my favorite stories there, The Circular Ruins, um, Three Versions of Judas, The Theologians. I could go on and on and on. At one point, I actually wanted to write a book of commentary on this, and I started doing that after uh, I finished college, in between college and graduate school, and did, never really made a lot of progress with it, but it might be something that I take up again. But this book, you know, again, came with me everywhere. Uh, it, it actually accompanied me when I went on my, my trip um, in between grad, uh, undergraduate and graduate school where I first went up to Quebec with my buddy Ed uh, to Montreal and hung out with some of my relatives there and then went over to uh, Europe and traveled around for about a month and a half on a Eurail pass meeting up with you know like old, old friends and people like that uh, right before I went to, to graduate school in southern Illinois. And then I, I, you know, I brought this with me and I was probably, you know, I remember using this in an aesthetics class. The professor was not super happy that I was doing that, but I, I was such a fan of Borges. And there's so much cool stuff in there in these stories. Obviously, there are, there are better story collections, but this was the one for me. And I remember, for example, when I was for a very brief period living at my, my mother's house after, you know, after, after undergraduate, I lived with a buddy called, who, whose name was Wild Bill for about three months and then came down to Milwaukee, lived at my mom's place until I got an apartment over on, on Farwell. And I remember like sitting outside, listening to New Model Army on my, my headphones, smoking a cigarette, you know, uh, drinking, drinking a, a Miller Genuine Draft and reading through these these stories, rereading them for who knows how many times. So, really, really great volume there. And then I and then I got to graduate school. And while at graduate school, I picked up some some other volumes that were quite important to me, as well. Um, this is Derrida's On Grammatology. It's the you know the French original of it. And there's a special story to this one as well, which is my mom, the first year that I was in graduate school, <clears throat> my mom went over to France. And I don't remember whether it was like a, a business trip or just for fun or something like that. But she asked me, is there anything that you want me to get? And I was getting into a lot of philosophy of language. And I was like, uh, you know, um, get me a good dictionary, get me some Derrida, um, maybe some Leibniz. She also bought me some Leibniz uh, stuff, the Discours de Metaphysique. Um, but this, you know, I, I almost wrote my dissertation on, on Derrida before I was talked out of it and then switched to talking about Hegel, Hegel and Blondell, and then eventually Maurice Blondell. And I read and reread this so often, and it was, it was cool to have it because, you know, one, my family's uh, francophone. 
Um, although my generation, most of the kids didn't learn French. And so this played a really important role for me, you know, as a young graduate student. Um, I really, I really enjoyed it. And it's, it's one of the things that I have, you know, my mother died over 20 years ago. It's one of the things that I have from her to remember her generosity, this, this particular book that I, I have. Um, I used to spend a lot of time in used bookstores while I was a graduate student. Um, both, we'd go to St. Louis and there were some amazing used bookstores there, but there was also a really great one on the strip in Carbondale. And as I was digging around, um, I found this, the works of Epictetus. Now, I'd never actually read anything beyond the Enchiridion when I was an undergraduate, and I thought, yeah, it's kind of okay. It, you know, I don't know that I buy all this Stoic stuff, but I didn't know that much about Epictetus. And I picked this up in the bookstore and started reading it through. And I saw that it was talking about the will and about freedom and about choices and all this other stuff. If you don't know the discourses, so the Enchiridion the, in the handbook, that's a, a sort of very short selections from the discourses. We have four of the books of the eight books that were written by Arian, uh, Epictetus's student. And this is an older version, um, you know, older translation translated by Thomas Wentworth Higgison, right? All these funny English names. And, you know, I was, I was reading through it when I was in that bookstore and I was like, this is, this is the stuff I'm interested in. This is about all sorts of cool topics that tie in with everything from like character to the freedom of the will to, you know, metaphysics to, to all this, this great stuff. And so this was my real introduction to, to Stoic philosophy beyond Marcus Aurelius, uh, because this is much more substantive and to Epictetus himself. There are better translations out there. I don't recommend this one in particular, but this book will always have this volume will always have kind of a special place in my, my heart. Uh, I also encountered Alistair McIntyre's work, somebody who I would later have the opportunity to study with and actually get to know uh, a little bit. He was a cool guy. And uh, they, you know, I, I'd, I'd heard references to it and I found this at the 710 bookstore, was it, I think? That was the one that... Um, these two guys started on the strip. I might be mistaking that for, for a different bookstore, but um, they had all the cool philosophy stuff as well as like, you know, movies you could rent and things like that and, and an espresso machine so they can make you espresso. And this is the copy that I got. You know, it was already in the second uh, edition by then. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've worn it out. There's a third edition now, and it's, this is really quite nice to, to have, you know. Um, so McIntyre, after Virtue, made a major impact on me. There were so many things where I was like, yeah, this is, this is what I, I've been trying to, you know, think and articulate. He finally put a, a name to it and a frame to it. So that was, that was quite important. Um, then we can talk about books that are kind of grad school and beyond. So when I wrote my dissertation on Maurice Blondel, um, I did a lot of work from his untranslated trilogy and, and other works. But the most important work of Blondel has always been Oxio 1893. There's two English translations. Um, the second one by Oliver Blanchette is, is quite reliable. The first one by James Somerville, you don't really want to have, but it was, it was cool at my dissertation defense. You know, I, one of the people there was Kenneth Stickers, who is the current chair of the Southern Illinois University at Carbondale philosophy department. He was the co-chair for my dissertation because my mentor, Garth Gillen had retired and Kenneth Stickers, um, when, a, after we had the thing, we went out, you know, for, for lunch together and he gave me this, which is the, it's not the original of course, right? But this is, uh, uh, French, you know, Presse Universitaire de, de France, um, uh, edition of, um, 
Blondel's L'Action 1893, Essay d'une critique de la vie et du science de la pratique, right? And so I've had this ever since, and it's, it's really nice to have. It's also nice to have the pages cut, because when I have to do it, I screw it up. Uh, another book, you know, when I, when I was in graduate school, I studied um, classical Greek, and that opened up a whole world to me in terms of Aristotle. Um, this is a Loeb edition of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. As you can tell, it's been, you know, beaten up quite a bit. There's lots of little sticky notes in here. There's lots of underlining and writing in here as well. And this book, um, probably more than any of Aristotle's works, has, has really gotten its... Uh, I've gotten a lot of mileage out of this particular edition. It's getting to the point where, you know, the binding is starting to break. Um, maybe I'll have to get that fixed someday in the future, but I'm not super concerned about it so long as the words are still legible and I can carry it around. This has spent a lot of time in a back pocket or a hip pocket of, of you know, one of my um, suits or, you know, uh, pants. Uh, I carry this in and out of Indiana State Prison all the time when I was teaching there and, and you know, working through Aristotle. I don't know how many times I've read through the work, but this is, this is a real favorite of mine. Um, I mean, I, I like all my lobes, but that's probably the one I like the best. Finally, I'll, I'll mention this, this volume. Now, this is kind of a funny story. I actually have three copies of this. In part, this is, this is the Prayers and Meditations of St. Anselm with the Proslogion, translated by Sister Benedicta Ward. Um, and for some reason, I had, I had a copy before, right, with a different cover, and I didn't lose it, but I misplaced it. And I needed it. I was doing a lot of work on St. Anselm, really from about 2002 through about, I would say, uh, 2016, 2017. I still do work on Anselm occasionally, but not, not quite as much. And so I, I couldn't figure out where my volume was. And so, the, the, you know, my prayers and meditations. And I do a lot of work that incorporates Anselm's prayers and meditations, which, by the way, are worth reading for their own sake. Even if you're not remotely religious or theistic, just for the beautiful artistry and rhetoric and, and the depth of thought, it's worth checking out. So we bought another one, right? We bought, we bought this copy. And then I ended up, you know, I put all sorts of marginalia in here and underlining and dog-earing pages and stuff like that. Then I misplaced this copy as well as the other copy. So we bought a third copy. I actually have three copies of the same work because of this foolishness of misplacing them. But it's good. You know, there's different underlining in each of them. There's different things that I've, I've pointed out. And um, it, it's a work that I go back to. I, I probably, at least once a week, read through one of these prayers by, by St. Anselm, somebody who I have a very strong attachment to. So those are, by my count, I think 11 books, um, 11 volumes, 11 particular physical copies, each of which has an important, not just intellectual uh, value for me, but a, a personal story, some sort of connection. And now I'm, I've shared it with you. And maybe you'll find them interesting. I'll put links to all of these in case you want to get, get a copy of it. Obviously, your copy won't be my copy, but it, you, know, you can start forming relationships like, like this yourself to these great authors and volumes.